Listo, Juan, estamos en vivo. Ok. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Today, we begin our celebrations of the 50th anniversary of the English Teacher Training College at Instituto Superior de Formación Docente número 22, Adolfo Alcina, in Olavarria. We are delighted to welcome colleagues and teachers-to-be as they join us in this series of webinars and talks for continuous professional development in English language teaching. To think about an anniversary necessarily implies looking back on our history. Mm -hmm. Our Instituto Superior de Formación Docente was created in 1967, and five years later, in 1972, the English Teacher Training College was founded. The extremely demanding task of planning the career, setting the syllabi, and teaching all the subjects was then requested to two well-known teachers from our city, who are no longer with us physically, but whom we fondly remember and honor today. Ana Fiorio de Alonso and Silvana Richo de Botino. They have made it possible for many of us to have the chance to study and become teachers of English in our own city. So it is in their memory that these talks and webinars will be held this week. 50 years have gone by. The significant changes and profound transformations which have taken place in education over the past five decades a living proof of the need for continuous professional development for anyone who wishes to fully understand the complexities of teaching nowadays, so that we can help our students to make the most of their learning experiences. In the field of English language teaching in particular, there has been an increasing interest in many areas, such as the need to develop intercultural communicative competence and the value of our own identity when communicating in English as an additional language, the right to comprehensive sexuality education, the relevance of a counter-hegemonic curriculum that can guarantee curricular justice, the value of situated and contextualized practice that empowers teachers and reinforces collaborative work, and the role of literature as a means to gain a sense of who we are and how we express that in a foreign language, among many others. These will be the topics covered throughout this week by a lineup of renowned ELT specialists who have kindly agreed to join us in the celebration. We thank them all for their generosity and their everlasting commitment to teacher education in our country. And what a better way to get started than having Claudia Ferradas as today's keynote speaker, delivering her webinar, Ourselves in English, Resources and Strategies to Express Identity in a Foreign Language. Claudia Ferradas graduated as a teacher of English at Instituto de Enseñanza Superior en Lenguas Vivas, Juan Ramón Fernández in Buenos Aires, where she taught language and literature for many years and was also academic secretary. She holds an MA in Education and Professional Development from, from the University of East Anglia and a PhD in English Studies from the University of Nottingham. She has worked as a teacher educator in more than 20 countries and has co-chaired the Oxford Conference on the Teaching of Literature on five occasions. Claudia has published two bilingual poetry collections and her poetry has also been published in several anthologies in Argentina, Puerto Rico, Spain, and the UK. In her podcast in Spanish, Palabras en Escena, she deals with topics related with poetry and drama with special guests. She also shares poetry readings in her YouTube channel. And now for all of us here in the Zoom room and for all of us, uh, for all those, sorry, who are following us live from our YouTube channel, without further ado, here is our very special guest, Claudia Ferradas. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much, Juan Ignacio, for this opportunity, for this invitation. I'm absolutely honored to be part of this celebration, to be part of this 
amazing lineup that you've put together. And especially because I particularly love your teacher training college. I've been there in person in the past. And uh, well, I'm thrilled that Zoom is offering us this opportunity and YouTube as well. We are very lucky to have these means of communication at, at a time when we know sometimes we, we cannot uh, make it possible to have an in-person presentation. So thank you very, very much indeed, Juan Ignacio, for this invitation. Congratulations to you all on the 50 years uh, and on the celebration. And thanks to all of you who are here today, either following us on YouTube or live on Zoom at the moment. Thank you very much for being with me this evening across the waves. And talking of waves, I would like to, to start our evening, if you agree, uh, as I tend to do, because you may have heard me before, with a story. Is that all right with you if we start reflecting on ourselves in English with a story? Would that be okay? So uh, I'm trying to share screen, if that's all right. Okay, let's see. I think you, you can see it all right. This is our cover. And uh, right. Well, this is a story that starts like every other story with the words once upon a time. And I'd like to take you hmm, to a place where I'm sure you would like to be, to a beach, a sandy beach in the Caribbean. Are you there? Because once upon a time, there was a tourist who was lucky enough to be in a hotel on a wonderful resort uh, there on the beach in the Caribbean. And she had spent a lovely day walking up and down the sandy beach, enjoying the view, the, the waves lapping the beach softly. But that night, after she'd gone to bed tired of so much eating and drinking and walking and shopping, she noticed that a storm had broken out. And the storm was really a bad tropical storm. You know, the waves were crashing against the walls of the hotel and she could hear the wind cracking the, the palm trees so that the branches would, would, would be, you know, crashing against the windows. Can you imagine? And, and she was a bit scared. But you know what it's like with tropical storms, they can get really bad, but they are generally short. And the next morning, as soon as the sun was up, she was up too, trying to find out how bad the storm had been and what the consequences of the storm had been on the beautiful beach. And so she started walking on the beach again, but this time she had to pick her way among the debris uh, that, that the storm had left you know, all the branches that were there, the cracked bits and pieces from the palm trees and whatnot. And she was really sorry uh, because she could see that, you know, the beach would soon be clean because so many people were trying to clean it. But, but she felt that so much work had to be done. And as she was walking up and down the beach, she noticed that there was something else that the storm had left on the sand. And she could get closer. And as she did so, she noticed dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of starfish, you know, beautiful starfish that were wriggling on the beach. And surely they would be dead a few hours later unless the tide helped and they were drawn back into the water. They were gasping for breath, gasping for water. And she was so sorry to see those beautiful starfish wriggling to death on the sand. Then as she was wrapped in thought, wondering how nature could be one day so beautiful and the next day so cruel, she saw, you know, stains, snatches of color, patches of color coming in her direction from a distance. Kind of brown stains and then very colorful ones getting closer and closer. What was that? And when it got closer, she could distinguish a human figure. Yeah, the brown bits were probably tanned, skinned, tanned skin. And uh, the colorful bits soon became colorful clothes, a shirt, a pair of shorts. And yeah, indeed, a boy got closer and closer. 
And she, as she was standing there on the beach, the boy was getting closer and she could see that he was moving in a regular pattern, that it was back, up and out to sea, back, up and out to sea. And when he got close enough, she could see what he was doing. He was picking up starfish and, you know, throwing them back into the water. And when he was close enough, she approached him and asked him, what's the point? What's the use of doing something like this? What difference does it make? How many are you going to save? 10, 20, 100 if we're lucky? Look, there are hundreds, maybe thousands on the beach. What's the point? What difference does it make? The boy gleamed his brilliant smile and he moved back again. And with his hand, he moved his arm up Imagine the starfish on his hand and he threw it back into the sea and said, it made a difference to that one, madam. Good day. And he walked on. And as he walked on, our tourist looked at him and she could see that behind his back, he was carrying a net, a fisherman's net, full of, guess what? Dogfish, starfish. The very same starfish that he was saving by throwing back into the water, they were wriggling inside his full brimming fisherman's net. And so she followed him. Oh, 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 wait a minute. You said it made a difference to that one. But see how many you're carrying, how many you're taking to their death. The boy stopped walking and smiled again. Madam, I think I saw you yesterday at my grandmother's shop, the shop on the pier, the souvenir shop. And I know you bought some things. You must have seen starfish, decorated starfish that people buy and take to decorate their bathrooms, for example. Well, that's why I'm taking the starfish home. That's what the storm has given me. That's the storm's gift. And so the tourist asked, why are you saving a few? And the boy smiled broadly again, picked up a starfish, threw it back into the water and said to thank the sea for the present and for the future. The present, the gift or the present moment where he was accepting what the storm had done and thanking for the gift for the future, because there was work to be done. There was something to be grabbed and used and transformed, but there was also something to be kept so that it's a sustainable thing to do. Well, I don't know how you understand the story. It can be understood in a number of ways. It can be used for a number of purposes as stories always can, but I think there's something interesting here that I'd like to focus on. And it's the fact that both the boy and the tourist speak the same language. However, they don't seem to share the same values or the same way of understanding the world. And that is what the boy needs to explain. That's what the boy needs to clarify. Language is not enough. And that's what I would like to explore further with you today. Globalization has allowed us to come into contact with people that we would never have dreamt of coming into contact with. And uh, especially media such as the one we are using right now. People from anywhere in the world could actually be listening to this as we speak. So learning as well as conflict have derived from the contact with difference. We know this only too well. And this has meant that as we construct, as we build our fluid, multiple identities, we cannot speak of our identity in the singular, our multiple identities, they come into contact with other identities and they change. Sometimes we see what the values of other people are and we say, wait a minute, I never thought of that in those terms. How about reconsidering what I've always thought? 
Hopefully that's what the Tories did. But maybe not. Maybe we see other people do things differently. We say, mm -mm, fine, I respect that, but I'm not going there. I don't want to do as they do. Some of you may have seen the video that I sent Juan Ignacio to advertise my talk. I was in class only last week with students who were in fact teachers, graduate teachers, university teachers from Uzbekistan. Do you know where that is in the map? Maybe not. Maybe you need to look it up. And the point is some of them were wearing a hijab. They were Muslims. And they were trying to explain to me why I shouldn't think that that was a mandate, that that was something that in some way limited their freedom, that that was a choice and the calling that only those who believed that their religion had to be expressed like that would choose to wear the hijab. Some of them didn't. They were trying to explain to me, not in Uzbek or in Spanish, our languages, but in the lingua franca, in English, something that had to destroy the sort of prejudices, the sort of stereotyping that I, as a Western Latin American woman had about areas of their culture. They created a whole lesson on their weddings and we laughed together. They made me do a listening where I had to choose uh, different songs, guessing whether they were celebrations, religious hymns, military marches, and guess what? They were not good, I thought, because my ears are trained to a certain kind of music that belongs to a certain kind of culture. Theirs was different. And I was amazed. I was sometimes shocked, others and often grateful. This is the enormous power, colleagues, of the lingua franca we learn and we teach. And any language can be used to offend, to insult, or it can be used to build bridges. This is what my talk is about, a proposal to build bridges in our very classrooms without the need to go too far. So in, where, in a way, this is what we have called global citizenship learning to become citizens in a world that is more and more interconnected. And that prefix inter is important because global citizenship is all about interdependence because it is about ourselves. How do I explain my culture to the world? But it's also about others. How do I listen to others, ask questions about them? And it's also about the environment. What we all share this globe which we are all worried about, and we should be. It is immediate and locally relevant. Think of COVID. We thought, ah, China, so far away. And in what, a couple of months, it was here, knocking on our doors, causing horror, fear, loss. So nothing more self-explanatory than the virus to explain how something that we thought was far away was locally relevant. It's global, but also local. It's rooted in the past. What have we done to be in the state of affairs we're in? It's present in our lives today, and it is going to affect our lives in the future. So I always make this joke. If we are worried about teaching tenses, nothing better than global issues, because they are rooted in the past, they affect us today, and they will affect us in the future. All tenses apply especially the one we find most difficult to teach, the present perfect. What have we done that has consequences today? So if we talk about the environment, the present perfect is the obvious choice. It's a meaningful communicative choice. I don't need to search any further for a communicative context to use it naturally. So if we want to teach tenses but go beyond language, what do we do? The Common European Framework, and you may be thinking, Claudia, we are not in Europe. I know, but the exams we normally prepare our students for 
if we want to, if they want to, if the parents want to, or even if we don't, even if we just say, no, I'm not interested in preparing students for exams, but how do I choose a textbook? How do I know what levels of the different textbooks or readers are, are in? Well, I use the levels and the descriptors in the, in the uh, common European framework. And um, the framework, you may know, was written in the late 80s, in the late, sorry, 1990s, at the end of the 20th century. And it was published at the very beginning of our century, 2001. But if you look at my slide, there's a figure there dated 1998. This was before the actual publication of the framework, when they were drafting the, the framework and they were discussing whether what they were drafting would go in the final edition or not. And if you have a look, that diagram you've got there speaks about skills. Normally we speak about four skills, don't we? You know, listening and reading, which we call receptive skills, macro skills, and then the productive skills that have to do with speaking and writing. And sometimes it's difficult, isn't it, colleagues, to say, well, is it that reading is really only receptive? Aren't we producing meaning as we read and uh, or as we listen? And uh, yeah, when we write and we speak, we produce, but if we haven't been receptors of the message, what are we responding to? So that division between reception and production is a hard one, really. And the framework, were, the framework writers were already considering this back in 1998 and saying, okay, instead of talking about four macro skills, let's talk about two big chunks of reception and production, but they meet when we talk about interaction. And again, the prefix inter, interdependence. Juan Ignacio spoke about interculturalism, interaction. Inter means that there are at least to participants, at least, and that they interchange, exchange meaning, words, culture. So what the framework was doing explicitly 23 years ago was talk about interaction. But I'm interested in this word. Notice what they did. Interaction, they said in some way, had to do with something previous that's also the end of the cycle. Mediation. Mediation in the sense that lawyers carry out mediation to prevent two people in conflict from, from clashing when they mediate so that two countries don't go to war, for example. We generally call it arbitration. Well, why was the framework talking about us, talking about language teaching, mentioning the word mediation in the 1998 pre-edition? because they were thinking of linguistic, cultural, social, and pedagogic mediation, ways in which we teachers in particular mediate between students and the language they are learning, between a text they don't understand and what they do know already, we are mediators by definition. And this will be in fact, the topic of my talk when I open the FAPI conference in Kukui in a few days. So I won't go any further in this. You may have heard me talk about this very recently, but I'd like to move a little bit further into something we've always done. And that suddenly now in the updated version of the uh, Common European Framework 2018 is made central, which are the skills that the framework considers part of mediation. Look, we've always had them in mind. Things like translating, a translator or simultaneous interpreter knows what it means to mediate very quickly between a language and another. And you might say, Claudia, but we don't translate in class. In class it's English all the time, please. Well, the framework seems to be saying otherwise. It's saying translating is a very important mediation skill. Why waste time explaining something 20 times for then our, trans our students to say, ah, Quiere decir esto, profe? And they translate, don't they? So suddenly the common European framework is saying, don't feel guilty about translating in class. It's another skill we need to mediate between what we know and what we don't know. Interpreting images, interpreting texts. We do that all the time in class, don't we? Explaining data. When they show us a graphic and we say, 
What does that mean? And so they turn the graphic into words. Summarizing, we practice that in class all the time. Simplifying a text. When it's too hard, we know we need to simplify it for our students to make sense. Breaking down complex information. Taking notes, a skill we are beginning to forget. You print screen, take pictures, ask for the PowerPoint, but how about taking down notes, which we know, according to neuroscientists, links directly our brains to our hands and therefore keeps it in our memory. What if we don't take down notes? Clarifying meaning, when you say something and the other person says, um, I beg your pardon, even in your own language, how often do you need to clarify meaning at home? Because you think it's clear, but it's not. Achieving goals in online communication. When I planned this talk, I had to think that I would be talking into the little light I'm talking at now as if I was on TV, can't see you. And does that make my method of communication different? Yeah, of course it does. Fostering respectful agreement. Wow, what a challenge for us. It's been in the papers all the time. How do you agree to disagree? How do you manage to say, I think differently without insulting the other person? A very important skill we also seem to be forgetting. And bridging cultural gaps and misunderstandings. All of these are now parts of the descriptors for foreign language teaching, especially for the teaching of English as a lingua franca, as a language of international communication. So how do we focus on explaining our own meanings in a foreign language, when most of the textbooks we use, excellent though they are, have nothing about ourselves or hardly ever. So, how? Well, it's my contention that we need to develop awareness of language varieties, that English is not the Queen's English, BBC English or American English only, but the Englishes we all speak, like the English I'm speaking now, full of my river plate Spanish in my accent. And with a bit of the local accent of the place where I teach in England. And that, instead of making me embarrassed, should make me proud of my identity as a plurilingual speaker. But I know, I know there are standards there are standards of communication that, are, that need to be demanded, not only for exams, yes, of course, but also for mutual understanding, precisely for mediation. So if I mispronounce a word so much that you cannot understand me, or if my handling of vocabulary and structures is so minimal that you can't make sense, I don't meet, I don't meet the basic standards of communication. So colleagues, I'm not saying do not teach grammar. I'm not saying do not teach vocabulary. I'm saying please do, but that's not enough. You need to present diverse cultures which express themselves in English. And because of colonialism, so many cultures express themselves in English. So many African cultures, Caribbean cultures. And what about ourselves right now? You might say, Claudia, you're speaking English because we are teachers of English. Yeah, sure. But how often have you spoken English to someone from England and America? And how often have you spoken English to someone from China, Japan? You name it. It's the language, as we say, of international communication. So how many diverse accents do we need to understand rather than whatever we call standard English? Dealing with issues that focus on mediation. We need to deal from a very early on with misunderstanding, with sorting out through some strategies, you know, the situation when somebody says, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand. And that's what we're going into. And encouraging the expression of our own selves from the early stages of language acquisition. Very often people tell me, all oh, right, when they get to advanced level, I'm going to do that. Too late. Very often our students never reach advanced levels. They give up their studies earlier than that. Sometimes they don't need to. And so, well, 
maybe they need to express their own meanings much earlier. So yeah, how? Claire Cramsh, who was one of the earliest people to publish on communicative competence, wrote as early as 1993 that the central problem of language teaching and learning is not teaching the present perfect, though we need to teach it, yes. It's to address the problem of wanting to express one worldview through the language normally used to express another society's worldviews. In the story I told you at the beginning of this talk, the boy who was saving some starfish had a certain view of the world, and he was using English to try and explain to the tourist, goodness knows what her mother tongue was, I don't know, didn't tell you that in the story, he was trying to make it clear to that tourist what his view of the world was. And that's what we do all the time. So, are you lost in translation by now? Are you lost in the question that your students always ask? Sir, miss, how do you say Milanesa? You've heard that, haven't you? Uh, well, and you're lost in translation there because there is no exact equivalent to Milanesa. Just as there is no exact equivalent in our language to saudade in Portuguese, for example. So my answer to that is we need to find resources that we will then turn into materials, into teaching materials with a local focus. And that's what I would like to demonstrate in the next few minutes. What makes materials intercultural? That is to say materials that allow us to ask questions to others about their culture, but also express our own meanings in English. Well, something as simple as localization, vocabulary and paraphrasing strategies. If I need vocabulary for the word Milanesa and I don't have it, I will need paraphrasing strategies. Well, it's meat covered in bread that you generally fry or cook in the oven. And you say, oh, so long, yes. I know, I know there are shorter equivalents, but then you'll have to explain that they're not exactly the same. So a breaded cutlet or something like that, I don't know what you say, uh, but whatever you say is a paraphrasing strategy. The million dollar question, you've done an exercise in the book, whatever it is, you've been learning about a place in Sydney, a place in, I don't know, uh, near New York. And then you say, and you? And what would happen if this applied to your city, your family, your neighborhood, just that. Just adding that question localizes the material and forces us to find the words to explain our own meanings. A comparative approach. Okay, they do it this way. How do we do it? Great to practice comparatives, but also to reflect on culture. So I'm not really saying anything new here. I'm just saying, stop for five minutes when you do your planning. Have you given your students the opportunity to say how that applies to their own selves? To compare between what's in the lesson and their own realities? That's all you need. Five more minutes in your class. And introducing different varieties of English, as we have said before, especially in the listenings so that they get used to listening to people who probably don't speak English as their mother tongue, just as we don't, and they need to understand their accents. So let's bring this down to reality. I put together a Padlet that has been growing for weeks now uh, for different talks I've been asked to give in person and online on mediation and on personal expression of meaning. I'm going to ask Juan Ignacio to copy that on the chat. Is, is that okay, Juani? Uh, and you on can also, phone. yes. And you can also see it on screen, so you can print screen and you've got a QR. So you, if you've got your phones there, you may want to access the Padlet now. It's not a new Padlet. It's a Padlet that has been growing with contributions from people in different workshops. So if there's something you want to add to it, you may. It will say that approval is pending. 
but that's fine. I will approve of anything that's useful, uh, but it's just to, so as to avoid hacking that I've got that kind of filtering process. But that is the, um, the Padlet link. And let me show you, I'm going to stop sharing screen for a minute. And now that I've found the Padlet, I'm going back to sharing screen. I'm going to show you what you can see in it. Here it is. Let me highlight some of the things that you may you find particularly useful for what I've been saying all this time. Here, you find a PDF of a magazine that Florencia Perduca wrote under my coordination 10 years ago already, or 12, 12 years ago, when the government of the city of Buenos Aires asked us to generate materials in all the languages taught in the city, uh, so that students could express their own culture. So there you find the magazine, it's freely downloadable. Here you've got the teacher's book with lots of activities on how to encourage reflection on ourselves. Outdated, maybe in some respects, it's 12 years old, as I say, uh, but the stories still hold good. And the ethos behind the whole publication is what we've been sharing. There are also the Cuadernos de Trabajo para el Aula de Inglés that you may be familiar with, uh, published by Silvana Barboni years ago as well, when the government of the province of Buenos Aires had a Dirección de Enseñanza Intercultural that was later closed. So there you are. And then you've got TED Talks, um, you know, pages on Anglo art, on Argentine stereotypes, lots of things that you may find useful. Uh, and I want to draw your attention to something that was more recently made in the province of Corrientes by the Dirección de Enseñanza Intercultural Bilingüe, with, with particular attention to Guarani speakers in Corrientes. They made these magazines, these little booklets to teach English where there's a, an American boy whose father comes to do some work in Argentina, in Corrientes. And so the boy needs to be welcomed into a, a state school in Corrientes. He is the odd one out. He is the one who doesn't speak Spanish. Then it's the children helping him to learn about ourselves. So it's for primary schools. And I think you may find it very interesting. Is it standard English? No, it's Corrientes English. Uh, does it have mistakes? Occasionally. Uh, but I think it's very, very useful in terms of what we can, you know, borrow in terms of materials design um, for uh, the sort of thing I've been saying. So back to the Padlet. I hope you'll find it interesting. It's going to remain there for a couple of months so that you can click and explore as much as you like. I have a limited time, so let me move on. For example, in that site on stereotypes of Argentina, I found this picture, which I shared in one of my courses some months ago. How many stereotypes of Argentina do you find? Let me have a look at the chat. Can you write any of the stereotypes of Argentina that you find in the picture? Let's see. Are you hiding behind the screen like your teenage students? Yeah, we drink mate, exactly. But can you see a mate there? No. What do you see? Asal, exactly, asal. Uh, and uh, how many of us are vegetarians, for example? How many of us cannot afford asal? Uh, but, you know, mate, asal. Hmm? Uh, look at the uh, physical appearance of the boys and the girls in the picture. So white, so middle class. Yeah, football, Fernando adds, of course. We don't see it in this picture. But in this picture, we have this idea of, you know, young people, good looking, all thin, all very white, all apparently middle class, or am I wrong? And I wonder how many of our students actually identify with that picture. Uh, is that all of Argentina? Is that the only view of Argentina we want to illustrate uh, our materials with? 
Just wondering, is that a provocative question? Maybe. Uh, perhaps we need different people in different parts of the country with different food uh, and not just this summary of Argentina. That's stereotyping. And talking about stereotypes is telling the only story about the country. And we know how limiting that can be. So maybe what we need to do is to invite our students to find other pictures, to add to this stereotypical view and explain to the world and create their own blog, their own web page, or their own poster on the wall with different views of our country. Simple. Look at what the, the text says under the picture. And I put that on, on the Padlet. In Argentina, and particularly in Buenos Aires, people tend to use a more direct, open and to the point communication style. Porteños are well known for the slang. Does Che Boludo sound familiar? Which is so widely used that people who've never been to Argentina before can take it as a sign of rudeness. If an Argentine talks to you very matter-of-factly or seems to have too much self-confidence, it's not a bad sign. They're actually taken, a, taken, they've actually taken a liking to you. I can see your smiles behind the screen. Really? And why should we be talking only about porteños? And what do people in the provinces have to say about this? So again, these are, you know, golden uh, pieces of resources that we find on the web, and we can use them to approach them critically, to say, yes, I agree, no, I disagree. How would you change it? And so we are practicing the language with a meaningful communicative purpose and going beyond the expression of what the others do into what we think. Very simple. Um, I keep sharing this example because I was reading this novel at teacher training college at Chimamanda Adichie's Half of a Yellow Sun. And in one of the chapters in that book, there's um, a scene in which uh, a man uh, welcomes a foreign journalist, an English journalist, into his house. And when he comes in, he offers him nuts, the cola nut, which, as a matter of fact, is used for the manufacturing of Coca-Cola. And cola nuts are very similar to cashew nuts. You can see them there. And they grow in trees. They're easy to get. They are cheap, if you like. And this... Sorry, Claudia. Uh, yes, Sorry for the interruption. I think we are seeing the Padlet, right? You should probably. Oh go back dear, to your... uh, I, I was sharing uh, the other. Right. Uh, you know what? I'm going to stop sharing and share again. I'm sorry. No problem. On my screen, thank you for telling me. I was uh, sharing the right thing. Uh, so I'll show you what we had before. That's why you answer the question with other things. I'm sorry, I was showing you this picture, which perhaps you haven't seen. You haven't seen it, Kwani, right? Right. They were looking at the Padlet pictures. There were some matters over there. Probably. Of course, you're it. right. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, uh, because this is what no, my probably. screen showed. Uh, so there we are. Sorry about that. This is the picture. That's why I was saying thin, middle class, uh, you know, dressed in a certain way. Uh, they look like models, don't they? Mm? How, how far is this the only version of Argentina that we can uh, produce in a picture? And this is what we had, I had read to you. Sorry about that. Hmm? Uh, you know, this is what I quoted about slang, okay, and, and stereotyping. So sorry about that. And now, yeah, the cola nut. You can see this guy offering a dish with nuts that look very much like a shoe nuts. In the novel by Chimamanda Adichie, Half of a Yellow Sun, whose title now, yes, you can read, I hope, on screen, um, the guy offers the, the cashew nuts and the English visitor says, no, thank you. Now, imagine if we were welcoming someone into our homes for the first time. We do offer food or drink, don't we? And what would we offer? What you wrote in the Padlet, of course. Mate. And even the poorest gaucho would offer you, as we know, mate. 
as, we, as the tango says, yerba de ayer secándose al sol. Even if they have nothing else, there will be amate. So culturally, there's so much in common because the Nigerian man feels quite offended by the fact that the Englishman says, no, thank you. And the Englishman says, no, thank you, because he believes the nut can be dirty because he doesn't know that it would have been enough to pick up the nut and put it in his pocket and save it till later. So very often we ignore how much we have in common with cultures that are far removed from our own, about which we're probably quite ignorant, and I'm including myself there. Um, and probably they are a fantastic opportunity for compar um, comparison and to say, while Nigerians give you a kona nut, we offer mate. And here suddenly, we see what we have in common as human beings. If we pick up an image, we said that part of mediation is describing an image into words, describing it critically, adding to visual literacy from multiple perspectives. Let me show you a picture. And these are two very well-known thinking routines according to Harvard University you know, what they call making thinking visible. You can ask a simple, uh, a question as, what do you see? And what do you think about the picture? What do you wonder? What don't you know? Can you share with me on the chat? What do you see? What do you think about the picture? What do you wonder? Let me have a look at the chat and see what you think. You see culture, Angelis says. What do you see about our culture? Yeah, from our country. Yeah. Hard work, Noelia says. Probably you're thinking about working in the fields. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you see? Anything you wonder? Anything you would like to ask the picture? Youth? Yeah, looks like a gaucho having mate. Yeah, exactly that. You see the point? I have cropped the picture. The picture is not complete. Um, I wonder what his life was like. And it's interesting that you use the simple past, Angel, because probably you're thinking this is a picture from long ago. How many years that picture is exactly? The mat, the symbol of sharing with others. Not Argentinian. Mm, interesting. Why does he look non-Argentinian, I wonder? You see, just with this picture, the weather conditions, the place, there's so much to wonder about. Mm -hmm. Lorena agrees with Adriana. And so we can go to the other thinking routine. What do you know? What do you want to know? Or what have you learned after all our conversation? Well, I haven't got time to actually do it with you, but this is an example of very simple thinking activities on a picture. I got this picture thanks to the British Council years ago, and let me show it complete. It's called a Welsh gaucho. So if you thought, mm, this is not Argentina, well, it is. But the guy is originally from Wales. He's an immigrant. And this is the complete picture. Does this mean sharing? Does this mean that this the Welsh woman, that the Welshes are supposed to have welcomed the Welsh to uh, Chubut? Uh, and does this mean they were sharing? that she has offered a mate to him. When I got this picture from the British Council, it was to illustrate a story I had written about the Welsh and the Tewelche. And it was given to me as a sign of sharing of how two cultures met and could live peacefully with each other. You know what? I showed this picture at the Universidad Nacional del Comahue years ago. And a Mapuche colleague of ours from the audience was very aggressive, shouted from the audience at me saying, surely she is the servant. She has been paid practically nothing to work for the Welsh and she is serving her master. She's not sharing a mate. And I said, maybe, maybe that's another side of the story. The story that the Tewelche could not write because they didn't write whereas the Welsh did write their story. Is there truth in one view or the other? I don't know. But what I was asking 
our Mapuche colleague was to say, tell, tell us your side of the story, but you don't need to shout. I'm not saying this is what the picture means. I'm asking, what do you think the picture may mean? So just this picture brought to me a number of questions. And this colleague of ours, who is the writer of the Mapuche Spanish Dictionary in its new edition, ended up coming to our classroom in Buenos Aires later on and talking about how even the older dictionary told the story that he needed to rewrite. How many stories do we need to rewrite when a picture shows stereotypes? Food for thought there. So we need to learn lexical items, definitions, paraphrasing strategies to express our identities in English. And I'm very much aware of the time. Let me show you three of the 110 books I have collected on Argentina, speaking about ourselves in English. These are some of the ones that were written in the last part of the 20th century. And they may be very interesting for you to pick up. And this is one of my favorites. I've been quoting it again and again. It was written by an Irish settler called Tales of the Pampas. His name is William Balfin. And he tells us of life in the province of Buenos Aires. Uh, I have no time to show you the text, but I want to stop here. You may have heard me talk about this before because I've been insisting on this all year. Uh, last August, only a few days ago, 20 days ago, was the centennial of William Henry Hudson's death. William Henry Hudson, born in Quilmes, Provincia de Buenos Aires, today Florencio Varela, uh, moved to Britain when he was 33. His parents were American, but his grandparents were British. He moved to London, never came back, and he wrote fantastic books on Argentinian birds. He was the first ornithologist in our country. He is honored even in Hyde Park in London. He's got a monument uh, because he's the creator of the Royal Society of Birds and Bird Watchers. And um, so being a naturalist would have been enough, uh, you know, to be remembered in our country because several birds in, in, in our country were discovered by him and classified, but he also wrote novels. And you may remember far away and long ago, in translation, which was used in schools many years ago and then was abandoned. Well, I just want to draw your attention to his books because at the moment there's a lot of material available because of his centennial. And because as he was writing for British readers, he was doing what we need to do in class. He was trying to find the vocabulary and the paraphrasing strategies to explain our culture, our environment, to the British. So if you want to have a look, and I, I put this in the Padlet, you can go to the website of the Hudson Museum because his house is a museum now in Florencio Varela. I have a look at this, Hudson Tiene Voz, which is a number of YouTube videos by people like Norma Leandro, for example, or Maria Kodama. One of them by Marcos Montes is in English and you have extracts beautifully illustrated of his books, and you may use them in the classroom very easily, and they are free. Mm -hmm. uh, look at what Borges said about his first novel. The Purple Land is perhaps the best work of gaucho literature, better than the Martin Fierro. Mm -hmm. And Cunningham Graham, who was uh, a millionaire who visited Argentina to buy horses, and who was the one who persuaded Hudson to um, write his novels. Cunningham Graham, by the way, died in Buenos Aires uh, trying to, uh, to, to visit uh, Hudson's house. Uh, he was at heart an old time gaucho of the plains, he wrote. So what can we find in his works that can be useful for us? Uh, well, I'm very happy to have just written a bilingual resource book for the classroom in Spanish, for Ciencias Naturales and Arts uh, and uh, Artes and Language and Literature in English with um, uh, another teacher who will be with you this, this week, Griselda Beacon. 
And uh, this will be available as from Thursday, freely downloadable. We are presenting it in Biblioteca Nacional on Thursday. So the whole book will be available and I will give Juan Ignacio the link so that you can all download it and use it as you wish. You get things like these, a little bit from El Ombu and other stories, an illustration that is Hudson's house and the Ombu, the real one in Florencio Varela that you can visit, and reflections and activities on that paragraph on local superstitions, for example. So questioning the text to pick up words and paraphrasing strategies to speak about ourselves. Look at this little sample from far away and long ago. I have highlighted in purple all the vocabulary that's useful to talk about the province of Buenos Aires or the Pampas. The undulating country had been left behind. Before us and on both sides, the land, as far as one could see, was absolutely flat, everywhere green with the winter grass, but flowerless at that season and with the gleam of water over the whole expanse. It had been a season of great rains and much of the flat country had been turned into shallow lakes. That was all there was to see, except the herds of cattle and horses and an occasional horseman galloping over the plain, and the sight at long distances of a grove or small plantation of trees marking the site of an estancia or sheep and cattle farm, these groves appearing like islands on the sea-like flat country. One paragraph, three resources to pay attention to. All I've highlighted in purple, is vocabulary that you may need to talk about the Pampas. At the bottom, what you find in blue is what we call glossing. He keeps the word estancia, as I kept milanesa at the beginning of our talk, and paraphrases it. Estancia, or sheep and cattle farm. And then in red, a comparison. The best thing we teachers know is to to learn something new or to teach something new is to relate what they already know to what they don't know. What the British know as flat is the sea from a distance. So every single writer writing for the British about the Pampas writes that it's a sea of grass, the sea-like flat country. That's the resource, the resource for mediation that we need to learn. So I hope this has tempted you to visit Hudson's work. And in his work, you will find mediation between past and present. He wrote this a hundred years ago. Different curricular areas, such as biology, different languages, because Spanish comes into his novels again and again, different countries and cultures meeting and different views of the world. So to close, a quotation from another Anglo-Argentine writer, William Shand, greatly admired by Borges. The Pampa, he writes, is never ending. Towns, mountains, rivers, hills, oceans, jungles become inconceivable. It is our jobs, colleagues, to give words to what is inconceivable for other people about ourselves. Thank you very much. You can find me on my website or contact me via Instagram. Follow me on Instagram, please. And there you will find the link in a few days to download the free book on Hudson in the classroom. Now I'm ready for comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Claudia. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Always a pleasure. Thank and of you. course, to, to um, revisit some of the ideas that you have been so clear about, uh, you know, ever since we uh, started getting in touch. This notion that the classroom has to be a place where we find ourselves, where we mm -hmm. talk about who we are, exploring identities, which is something sometimes difficult to see as, you know, really happening in, in the class. Actually, teachers seem to find it hard. And the choices are so many. Literature opens up for so many possibilities to do just that. Um, I am, you know, I am thrilled, and I also um, think it's a, it's wonderful that we are now in the Zoom, and also people following us on on YouTube. Um, we are reaching out to many teacher to be teachers to be, and that means that you know um, they can learn that there are ways to actually get it done. It's not just about sticking to course book proposals that aim at international audiences, 
but finding our own voice and, and giving students the chance to, you know, to raise their voice and to, to use English for purposes of their own. For, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, all so you need to do is adapt uh, because textbook writers do a fantastic job and we should be very grateful to them uh, and to the publishers because they give us so much material that makes that make our lives easier. Think of colleagues from languages where there are no materials, having to reinvent you know, every single class what they're going to take into the classroom. So we should be grateful, but then always add that extra turn of the screw. And what about you? And what about your family? And what about our neighborhood? And when we say, well, there is no word for that in English, well, great, that's exactly it. How do we explain it, explain it but as early as possible? And Hudson is a fantastic source for that. Uh, you don't need to, to read the whole thing, but if you pick up just the story, like for example, Marta Riquelme, which is one of the stories in The Ombu and Other Stories, uh, where uh, the action takes place in Jujuy during the so-called Campaña al Desierto. So the, the woman, Marta, becomes a captive. And uh, there's a Jesuit priest uh, trying to, to save her and not being able to. And she becomes a bird. Because as Hudson was fascinated by birds, his characters turn into birds. And so this woman becomes the kakue or kakui, or also called urutau in the litoral. So the whole legend of the kakue is there. And you can develop a whole unit of work on the bird and talk about birds in our country and explain in videos, you know, what, why people are afraid of the kakue or the urutau, which is such a special bird that mimetizes itself with trees. But then there's the story. So you've got literature, you've got language teaching, you've got biology, you've got knowledge of your own birds. And you know what? You, you rediscover things about your own country that you didn't know. So uh, why not do that and just develop a unit of work? So we've included all that in the, in the um, worksheets and they are freely uh, photocopyable. So you, all you need to do is, is download it. Wonderful, wonderful. So generous of you <laughs> and the team who uh, worked collaboratively for that. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful yeah. to Fundación Veronica Osejevich who sponsored the publication and uh, as well ESARP who, uh, you know, sponsored the workshops where we tried mm -hmm. out materials. We're doing a workshop um, on Wednesday to, to present this as well. And on Thursday in Biblioteca Nacional, the director of Biblioteca Nacional is presenting the books. If you're in the city of Buenos Aires mm -hmm. for any reason, visit Biblioteca Nacional where there's a whole third floor exhibition on Hudson's works, uh, which is really fascinating. And you Wonderful. can take your students all the way from Ola Olavarria into Florencio Varela, and they will prepare a workshop especially for you and show well, you his house. Mm? And, the, the, and it's a sanctuary. It's a, a sanctuary protected by the Provincia de Buenos Aires, where you can still hear the birds he used to hear. Lovely. You see, many projects can be now <laughs> uh, put down on paper and just start working on that, right? But everyone. Uh, Are there any questions, that. Ignacio? I can't see them on the, on well, the chat. They're just know. thanking you uh, as you're contributing to your knowledge. Thank you all. <laughs> um, and, and I don't know, it will open up for questions if you want to uh, write something on the chat box. And somebody uh, loves Sebastian's Pride. I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to see the omissions in a novel like Sebastian's Pride, where there seem to be no original inhabitants. It's mm -hmm. the gaucho and the natives, the natives being us, hmm? but uh, no, no, no Indians. The Indian is mentioned twice and twice mm -hmm. derogatorily. So that's a very interesting omission in itself. Maybe. Uh, we need to revisit some of the chapters and maybe add part of the information. I don't know. That's, I always say the, the more a book resembles a Swiss cheese full of holes, full of gaps, the more interesting for teaching. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think probably no more uh, comments or questions this far. Okay. We, we want to thank you immensely well, thank you. for the chance you've given us to, um, you know, 
uh, keep thinking about how to make the most of our own teaching profession. For Thank those you for who the are, opportunity. Absolutely. For those who are teacher training, for those of us who have already uh, finished, but still, you know, have so much to learn. Um, I, I keep thinking about these concepts. You talk about mediation and, and helping learners become global citizens. And in times like these, we need lots more of understanding, raising awareness of difference. We can see that happening. So um, I hope everybody compromises to that. Mm -hmm. You are lovely. Thank you so much for your generosity you. once again. Thanks and to everybody here and those listening on YouTube. And I wish you the very best in the next 50 years. And, uh, you know, keep on growing and trying out new ideas. And I hope to see you in person someday soon. Of course. Same here. Thank you so very much. Bye, everybody. And thanks so bye much. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. Thank, you. Bye. thank, thank you. you. And bye, everyone. Thank you very much to, to all of those following here on Zoom and on YouTube. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye. See you tomorrow with more. <laughs>